Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We are continuing to share with you on messages relating to getting you ready for all that will be happening down the road in these end time events that are going to be occurring in these last days. We begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so become, is what the word means, not be, become holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation means manner of life, conduct, behavior, meaning everything that you do. When it says to become holy, this is the command, as we see. Ginnamai is a command, imperative mood, meaning you and I are commanded to become holy. Notice if you become holy, it's going to be a work in process to produce that in your life. It's not just some one-time thing when you get born again and you get a brand new spirit that, that is right before God. It is a process of you becoming holy, and it's to be in everything that you do your entire life. Well, just as we talked about how you must, it's mandatory for you to be righteous at all times, it's also mandatory for you to be holy at all times as well, to be true saints who are holy ones. It is absolutely mandatory. Now, we've completed talking about righteousness and how it's mandatory for everyone. Let's just review a few of the things that we've seen. In Romans chapter 8, verse 10, if Christ be in you, when you get born again, the body is dead because of sin. It's not been changed. Death still, it's, it's a dead thing. If your spirit leaves your body, your body's dead. It has a, a sin dwelling in it. But the spirit, and it's not talking about the Holy Spirit, it should not be capitalized. There's no capital letters here in the Greek. It should not be capitalized. The translator made a mistake. It's talking about your spirit. The spirit is life. Why? Because of righteousness. Because you have a brand new spirit, you have a righteous spirit now. Now, Romans chapter 6 tells us that now, because we are come to the place of being dead, having died to sin, that we're not to live in, in sin any longer because we don't have a spirit of being a sinner. We now have a righteous spirit. And we must understand that being righteous is more than just getting a brand new spirit. It is being righteous spirit, soul, and body. How are we that died to the sin? Not are dead as far as a noun, but the ones who died. This is a verb here. We died to the sin. How can we live any longer therein? We can't, unless we're in rebellion to God and in disobedience and yielding to the enemy in our life. We see in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin not might be destroyed. It's not really a good translation. It's better understood. might be rendered idle because you have a body of sin that's still there. It might be rendered idle. It might be inactivated. It might be inoperative. Even though sin dwells in the body, it's not going to function because you're not going to let it. You're not going to give place to it whatsoever. That henceforth we should not serve sin. We aren't going to serve sin. We're going to serve righteousness and serve the Lord. For he who died, not that is dead, but he who died, a verb again, has been set free from the sin. You have been set free, and this is a word that means set free because of the fact that you're right, have a righteous spirit now. This means in the past, being a perfect tense, meaning it's completed in the past with present effects. You've been set free. You and now, sin has no dominion over you, and you are to walk free from all sin in your life. Because of that, verse 11, likewise reckon or count your all selves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive or living, this is a verb here again, living unto God. You're living unto Him because now you have life because you have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. This is a command to you and me. Well, that means that we don't have to let sin operate at all. It's a command and it's present tense ongoing action. 
you are not ever to let sin be an, a, ever operating at any time in your mortal body. How would you let it? You have to obey it. And where is it operating from? From the body, the sins dwelling in the flesh, that you should obey it in the lust thereof, in its cravings, in its desires. We're not going to yield to any of that because you're going to get your mind renewed to the truth and you're going to do what the Word says at all times. And then not only your body, but also neither, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but you're to yield yourselves instead unto God. And these are commands, both of these words for yield, commanding statements. You're commanded to yield yourself unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members instruments of righteousness unto God at all times. Now we talked about, then as you yield your members to be obedient to God's Word, that produces righteousness, which we see. Romans 6, 16. Know ye not to whom, that's talking about a person, you yield yourself servants to obey, because if you obey sin, you're obeying the devil, not just obeying sin. When you obey God's Word, you're obeying God. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. That tells us. How do we produce the righteousness? By obedience. What is righteousness? Doing right. Doing righteousness. Doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. That's how righteousness gets produced in your life. Now remember, verse 17, God be thank you. We're the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine was delivered you, and the gospel came to you. And now made free from sin because you don't have a sinner spirit any longer. You, die, you died to the sin. You became servants of righteousness. You have a righteous spirit and you are a servant of righteousness. And now you are to live unto righteousness at all times. Remember, the ones who are righteous are the ones who are doing righteousness continually. Righteousness is more than just getting born again. It is spirit, soul, and body. It is in all aspects of your life doing the word of righteousness. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that is doing continually, present tense, righteousness, is righteous even as he is righteous. These are important things that we brought forth thus far. And then verse 10 also is important. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whoever is not doing righteousness, why would you be a child of the devil? Because it says, to whom you yield yourselves to servants to obey, that's whom you are a servant of. Meaning, if you're not doing righteousness, you're doing unrighteous lawlessness, you're a child of the devil because you're serving the devil. You're giving place to him. Whoever is not doing righteousness is not of God, neither he that is not loving his brother. We must be doing what the Word says at all times. And what's going to be evident that you are righteous because you're doing righteousness continually. And what does that produce? That produces what Paul prayed for the Philippian, the Philippian church for, which was fruits of righteousness. This is a prayer that he's praying for them. He pray all these things that he's praying, and among those was being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness because fruit comes from the Word, and the seed gets in it, it grows and produces the fruit continually over time working. That's the same thing with the Word in you. The Word of righteousness that you do consistently will produce the fruits of righteousness. So as we saw in righteousness, the first step is getting a new spirit and then doing the Word of righteousness in all areas so that you bring forth the fruits of righteousness and you're to be righteous spirit, soul, and body. And then we saw also that the judgment is coming in Psalms 9, Verse 8, to the world according to righteousness. He said he shall judge the world in righteousness. It's going to be judged, but not just the world in righteousness. Also, all of his people are going to be judged in righteousness. Psalm 72, 2, he shall judge thy people with righteousness as well. Everybody is going to be dealt with according to righteousness. Now, we've talked about the fact that as we're approaching the end of the church age, we see that there is judgment that will begin, and it starts with the church. First Peter 4, 17, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, that's the church, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them obeying not the gospel of God? 
it's going, they're going to be in trouble. Who are the ones who come through and are past the test of the judgment? The righteous. With difficulty and not easily because they have to conquer and overcome the enemy and all of the evils that will be coming forth of the lawlessness and the unrighteousness and all the tremendous pressure to compromise and turn away, and plus the deceitfulness that will come from the lying signs and wonders that the Antichrist will be doing, all these things. Just tremendous deception is the mark of the last days. The righteous, with difficulty and not easily, are being saved. Present tense. Remember, salvation, just as righteousness, is an ongoing work. As you are doing righteousness and you are seeing the work of salvation being accomplished in your life. And we saw also that when we get to the end of the tribulation, the ones who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that are going to be with Him in the marriage, who are they? They're also the ones who are righteous, doing the word of righteousness. And we see in Revelation 19:7, let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. When it says here it's come, it means this is looking back on it, the fact that it has happened, because this is a aorist tense, which in this case would be a simple statement that it did come, as Young's brings out, because come did the marriage of the Lamb. And his wife has made herself ready. Well, the wife means she's married, and it's looking back on what she did. She did make herself ready. So, the wife, of course, is the church, the ones who are the saints, that is, not just those who are born again, but those who are the righteous, holy saints. And we see in verse 8, it says, Why, what happened? What'd she do? To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous acts, the righteous deeds, as we see. Here, when we look down here, this is plural, referring to the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints who are the holy ones. So we see that all the people that are going to be in the marriage are the righteous ones. Again, they're the only ones that are going to come through. And what others also saw that you've got to be righteous all the days of your life. As we saw in 2 Peter 3, verse 13, the only ones that are going to make it into the new heavens and the new earth are the righteous. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Only the righteous will get to the new heavens and the new earth. Now, in light of all this, we are going to go one, other, one step further that's very important. Because it's not just righteousness, it's also holiness. Every person must also be holy. Here, remember what it says as we glance back at Revelation 19 again. In verse 8, when it says, The fine linen is the righteous, righteous acts, righteous deeds of who? The saints. And who are they? The holy ones. Well, that means the holy ones are the ones that are up there. So, you and I, as we saw to begin with, we are commanded to become holy, as He is holy. It's a command to every single one of us, and that means we're to be the saints. Now, how does God produce His righteousness in us? It's because of His Word that He performs in our life, and it's because we're in covenant relationship with Him that He can perform all these things. And we saw in before, in Jeremiah 23, in verse 6, where it says, In the days Judah shall be saved, Israel dwell safely, and his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. This is Jehovah Sidkenu, the covenant-keeping name of the Lord, our righteousness, where he will produce that in our life as we are doing the word of righteousness. Well, how's, how's the holiness going to happen? It's the same thing. God's going to perform his covenant of holiness and sanctification in our life because God's the one who does the entire work. Leviticus 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. 
He's commanding them the, here to be holy and they're sanctify themselves. They have a part to play, just you and I have a part to play, as you will see. You should keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifies you. This is the word Jehovah Kadash, the one who sanctifies us. Again, the covenant keeping name of the Lord. And he will produce this. You must understand that righteousness means doing what is right in his sight of the word of righteousness that produces righteousness. Holiness, we must realize though, is the result of righteousness, but also has more to do. The reason we say that is because in Romans chapter 6, we went up to verse 18, but we come to verse 19. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, which means lawlessness, unto more lawlessness, because whatever you yield to will increase, even so now yield your members, and when he says to yield your members, again, this is a command to you and me. Yield your members, servants, to righteousness, which we saw were to do by being obedient to the word. And what does that produce? Unto, resulting in, holiness in your life. So doing righteousness is one aspect of what produces holiness in your life. And this is by you doing it ongoingly. The reason we say that is because we come to verse 22, being now made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness. What's the fruit from? From the righteousness. Meaning you've been doing righteousness continually is what the implication is because it talked about righteousness produces holiness and what righteousness, the fruits of it, by doing it consistently is what produces holiness and the end result is everlasting life. Now, when we talked about the fact of who is going to make it up there to the marriage, well, that means who's going to be in the rapture. That means the ones are going to come through and be with the Lord. They were the saints, the holy ones. Now, we talked some time back about the subject of the rapture, and we pointed out that as the judgment comes on the church in Revelation 2 and 3, and then the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation, which it does, that the ones who come through that are the righteous ones. But we also pointed out at that time, as many people have said, well, the church, they thought the church is taken out early because they don't see the word church from chapter five, four on after the judgment on the church, which is in Revelation 2 and 3. Well, why is that? Because the ones who pass the test are the righteous ones who are also who? The saints, the holy ones. That's why you only see the word saints used from that point on throughout the time of the tribulation. So, since they're the ones, that means that's the church now. The church is not, not just everybody who's born again. It's only the holy ones. Why would that be? Because of what's also going to happen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We talked about how you, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, the parousia, the second coming, of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering. Remember, by is not there. And our gathering together unto him, which is the rapture, the catching of the church, to meet the Lord near. He says that you may not soon shake it in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or by letter as of us, that the day of Christ is at hand. They thought it was about to come any time. Let no man deceive you. Now remember, whenever we see the deceiving, that's telling you the subject it's about to talk about, and God's foreknowledge knows that the teaching out there is going to be all wrong and false about it, which is the pre-tribulation rapture. We're going to be out of here before any of these things, anything happens with all the judgments and the Antichrist coming on the scene and all these things. It's all a lie. We know that, that we're not leaving early. We're going to be here during that time. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of when he comes and gathers the church unto him, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Well, that means this happens before. And that the man of sin be revealed. So these two things are going to happen before that day would occur. So when we talk about this falling away, this is a word which is the word apostasia, which means an apostasy, where we get our word apostasy from. It is a defection, it is an abandonment, it is a forsaking, it's the word that also is translated forsaking, 
a turning away and leaving God. This is what is going to happen because the judgment on the church is going to determine who is really following Him and doing His word of righteousness and who isn't. And only the ones who come through, they'll be the righteous ones and the saints, the holy ones from that point on. That's why all are called the saints from then on throughout the tribulation period, the holy ones. So this is going to happen. And the man of sin is going to be revealed. Well, if that's all going to happen before that day, then you know it's not going to happen. A pre-tribulation rapture is a lie, as we've already proved and pointed out in the past. If you didn't hear all that series, I encourage you to hear it so you'll understand all the truth about it and answer every one of the objections that people have brought forth that are, that are all false, thinking that there's a pre-tribulation rapture when there is not. We also see that during the time of when the Antichrist has come on the scene, What's going to be happening? Lawlessness is going to be abounding. He's called the lawless one, as we pointed out. And in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness, iniquity is the word anomia, meaning lawlessness. Nomos means law. A is a prefix meaning without, without law. Because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many shall wax cold. And the love is talking about all of the Christians. These guys aren't going to pass the test. The lawlessness is going to abound. And these ones, this is the agape love, talking about those who are born again. They're going to wax cold. They're going to be, they're going to be in trouble. Also, we see that Jesus even said, anybody who's turning away and walking in the way of lawlessness, it's all over for them. Matthew 7, 23, when he said, Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you, because they aren't walking in the way of the Lord anymore. Depart from me, you who are working, present tense, ongoingly, lawlessness again, anomia, as Young's brings out. Anybody working lawlessness, they're going to hear depart. And the same thing is true if anybody does not deal with the unrighteousness as well. We see it over in Luke chapter 13. We talked about this before, but in verse 27, when he said, I tell you, I know I have not known you from where or from what condition you are. Depart from me, all you workers of not lawlessness this time. This is the word adakia, which means unrighteousness. Anybody who's walking in unrighteousness or walking in lawlessness, they're going to say, depart from me. They're not going to be with the Lord whatsoever. So, that tells you the fact that everybody has got to be not only righteous, but they've got to turn away from any unrighteousness or lawlessness as well. They've got to get it all out of their lives and turn away from all of these things. And we've already seen that we must be holy. We're commanded to be holy. And we see one example of why we have to deal with all this unrighteousness and get rid of it out of our life is because 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The foundation is established by you being a hearer and a doer of the word continually, and this be, makes you strong and movable and firm, and nothing's going to move you if you have it established. And having this seal means that it authenticates who's the real one. This refers to being authenticated, not like you're stamped. It's something that's confirmed, proved, or authenticated. If you notice what it means here. Anything that's confirmed, proved, or authenticated, and you're going to be affirmed and authenticated because you have the foundation established in you by being a hearer and a doer of the Word. The Lord knoweth them that are His, implying that there's those who are His and those aren't His. He knows the ones that are His, though. And then He says, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart. This is a command. Everybody who does this, we're commanded to depart from iniquity, which this time is the word adakia, again, meaning unrighteousness, as Young translates it. You're commanded to depart from unrighteousness. And in doing so, that means you've got to go through the cleansing process. And that is part of holiness. Holiness not only is going to be produced by doing righteous, but it's going through the cleansing process, the purging process of getting rid of everything that is not of Him to come to the place of holiness. And that's mandatory. You must be righteous and you must be holy at all times. That means all the cleansing has to happen in our life. 
If a man therefore purge, cleanse out, cleanse out thoroughly from these of the unrighteousness, he shall be a vessel unto honor, having been sanctified, meaning this is necessary to see this completed work, which is sanctification, which is a completed work that's to happen because it would be a perfect tense, bringing completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking, I mean it's ongoing effect, because that's the way you are now. You walk in holiness and sanctified all the time in all the days of your life. And you're meet for the master's use. And you're prepared under every good work. God wants every single person to come to the place of being cleansed. You've got to cleanse yourself of everything. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having these promises, dearly beloved, it doesn't say just take hold of them and they'll all come to pass. That's one aspect. You do have to take hold of the promises with your faith. But there's more to it than that, as this points out. What do we do? Let us cleanse ourselves. Well, that is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning might we cleanse ourselves, meaning it's conditional. It's not automatic. You have to see it be done. Might we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. That would be anything that defiles us. Anything that's unclean has got to be eliminated or you won't be holy. All filthiness of the flesh, anything of the flesh, any of the human nature, anything that's contrary. You can have a mind of the flesh, wrong thinking, yielding to things, wrong choices. You can be following the will of the flesh. It has a will. Anything of the flesh, so that would be from the body or from the soul that's yielding contrary to the Word of God and the filthiness of the spirit, which is what? It's not talking about our spirit. It's talking about the spiritual filthiness in us, which is what? The evil spirits that have come in from the open door of sin. And we have them from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. That's why we got to go through the total cleansing process in our life. And what does that produce? That perfects holiness in the fear of God. That brings the perfection of it. So as you're on the road, of getting rid of all the filthiness in your life and casting out all the evil spirits, you're on the road to perfecting holiness in the fear of God, which also means you've got to have the fear of God before you all the days of your life. And remember, holiness is mandatory, just like righteousness is. We know that because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it makes quite a statement follow peace, which means to run after, dioko, with all men, and holiness. You're going to run after holiness. That's what we should be running after, without which no man shall see the Lord. Well, that means holiness is mandatory, just like righteousness is mandatory at all times in our life. Therefore, holiness has got to happen. And remember, holiness is not just getting a brand new spirit to have a sanctified spirit. It's also seeing the sanctification process be completed in all areas. It's spirit, soul, and body. We can see this when we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the whole person. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, so that's what's going to be in, coming to the place of being blameless means you've arrived at holiness. It's been perfected in your life unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. He desires for you to come to pass. When it talks about this, this is in the optative mood, meaning this is a rare mood, not very often in the New Testament. It means it's his desire and his will for you, what he wants, that you would be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord. Now, how's this going to get done? Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. If you obey the call of God, that's why we have to fulfill the call of God by doing the things he said. We are called, and we are also told that we are to be holy before him. It is expected of every single one of us. Holiness also refers to meaning, the word actually means to be set apart or to be separate. And it involves the cleansing and being purified. 
You're to be set apart from things that are not of God. You're to be separate from those things that are unclean and not touch unclean things. And you're to be cleansed and purified. Holiness is spirit, soul, and body. We can see this was even declared in Exodus chapter 19. In verse 10, we've seen this many times before. The Lord said unto Moses, Moses is a type of Christ. This is in the third month, the time of, at when Pentecost occurs. This is talking about the New Testament age prophetically. Go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, two days, which is the 2,000 years of the church age. A day is the 1,000 years. And let them, that's the people, Wash their clothes. Wash is the word to perform the work of a fooler, and a fooler would wipe out all, every speck of dirt to get it as white as snow as possible. You are to get everything that is filthy out of you. You are to wash your clothes, and that's the things that you have on in your life. The clothes is what you put on. You've got to put off the old man, those are the filthy clothes, and you put on the new man, which is the, the righteous clothes, as you put on the, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got to get washed of all these evil things as you're putting on the good things at the same time. You don't put on those good things and then keep the old things still hanging on. No. You've got to get washed as a fooler. And then he says, be ready. Again, remember those guys that were ready? They were ready because they were clean and white and they were doing their righteous deeds of the holy ones, the saints. They had, the ones got the fine linen. Now why is this? Because they were ready. They made themselves ready, the ones who got in the marriage, against the third day. Because what's the third day? Remember, the third day is when there's the marriage. Remember John chapter 2 we've talked about in the past? The third day there was the, a marriage at Cana, but the marriage between Jesus and the disciples who are called, who are the ones who have much fruit, who are holy and righteous before him. The third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. This was upon Mount Sinai at that time, but pointing towards what's going to happen prophetically when he comes and he will be coming to catch up the church to meet the Lord in the air and take us up for the marriage of the Lamb in heaven. And that will be in fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. So, the other thing you have to realize is you've got to be righteous and holy. Because if you're not righteous and holy, you're not going to be there. Again, remember, who are there? The ones who have the righteous deeds and acts of the holy ones, the saints, who are clean and white. And the lying teaching has been, well, you know, God will just make up for what? For all my wrongdoings and filthiness and all this stuff at the end, and he'll just kind of Zap me and I'll be holy and righteous, you know. <laughs> Lies. This destroys that. Revelation 22, 11, He that's unjust, not righteous, let him be unrighteous still. He's not going to make up for you not being righteous. He that's filthy, he didn't cleanse himself. Let him be filthy still. Those guys are in trouble. He that's righteous, let him be righteous still. He that's holy, let them be holy still. The righteous and the holy are the ones who make it. The unjust ones and the filthy ones, they're not going to make it because they're not in the marriage group. Now, as we understand that we're to be holy, spirit, soul, and body, and we understand also that who is going to be there in the last days, having passed the judgment of the church, it's the righteous. But who else are they? They're the saints, remember, because that's what we saw, that only the saints are mentioned after the judgment is upon the church. <coughs> so we need to see also about what it says about the saints during this time of the tribulation and going forward. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, this is Moses prophetically speaking something at the end of his days. Deuteronomy 33.1. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. <coughs> Verse 2. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. Hmm. When's that going to be? 
It's prophetic of the end times. And from his right hand, authority and power, went a fiery law for them. Because what's going to determine who is the ones that are right with him? The ones that are walking in line with his law. He goes on and says, Yea, he loved the people, all his saints, these are the holy ones, are in his hand. Not the ones that are filthy and unrighteous. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Well, that tells you about who the saints are. They're the ones that sit at the feet of Jesus and get the word of God in them. They receive his word. They put it in operation in their life. They're hearers and doers of the word. And they do all the things that he says, including getting the cleansing accomplished and purifying and getting, getting, getting set apart, uh, separated unto him and do all the things that he says. They are the saints, the holy ones. This is a prophecy that those ones who sit at his feet and receive the word will be these holy ones. And they're going to be the ones that come with him, the 10,000 saints. This was in the Old Testament. And then we see now in the New Testament... In Jude, verse 14, also a prophecy that came from Enoch. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Same thing. These are the holy ones, because only the holy ones are with him, remember. He's coming with the ten thousands of the saints. And what are they going to do? They're going to execute judgment upon all. Because you have learned the ways of righteousness and you're holy and you're going to be one who's going to be bringing forth the rule and the reign. You're going to be judging the world, even judging angels it talks about. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds that they've ungodly committed, all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Yeah, these are the ones. And all these ones are the ones that haven't, aren't righteous and holy. They're the murmurs, the complainers, walking after their own lusts. If you're a murmur and complainer, you're in the flesh. You're not holy. If you're walking after your own lusts, you're not holy. Their mouth speaking great swelling words, whatever they want. No, you're only speaking, you're supposed to speak righteousness, remember. Having men's personal admiration because of advantage, scratching someone's back who will help them and then forgetting everybody else, all they're out for is for getting advantage for themselves. they got respect to persons. They're not righteous either. These guys are all in trouble. These are the ones that aren't righteous. Every single one of us. There's going to be mockers in the last time walking after their ungodly lust. Anybody that's walking after ungodly lust, it's over if they don't repent. They will not be with the Lord. Only the righteous and the holy ones, the saints, will be with him. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. They separate themselves away from the way of the Lord. Hmm, sounds like the fall away group, doesn't it? The ones who turn away. They're going to walk in their own ways. And they're, they're, not, they're going to separate themselves. We're supposed to be building ourselves up. And he comes down to verse 23, to save others, we want to see them come out of being in that state, so they're not, if they're not holy and righteous, they're, they're going to be in trouble. Save others, others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. If you have any works of the flesh, you're spotted. Are you holy? Are you blameless? No, you're contaminated. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, remember. You can't have some contamination on you whatsoever. We cannot have our garment spotted by the flesh. Now, the saints are the ones that are going to come through. And we need to look at about the saints. Scriptures that talk about the saints. These are the holy ones. 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 9. He will keep, guard, shamar, the feet of his saints, He's going to guard those who are the holy ones. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Ah, oh, the wicked, they're abiding in darkness. They aren't going to be protected. But God will keep and guard the feet of the, of the saints. He goes on and says, The adversaries of the Lord are going to be broken to pieces. The judgment is going to come on them. 
Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. That's judgment. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Of course, Jesus is the one who's going to be releasing all these things as he sends those angels to start bringing all these judgments coming upon them. And he's going to be thundering. The adversaries of the Lord are going to be broken. Yet the saints, that is the church who has come through the holy ones, has passed the test and are wholly right with the Lord. They're going to be guarded. They're going to be protected. We see in Psalms 16, verse 1, Preserve me, guard me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. We've got to trust in him. O my soul, thou hast said it unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my, my goodness extend not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent, to whom is all my delight. So who's going to see God's protection and preserving, guarding the saints, the ones who are considered excellent in the sight of the Lord, that are walking right? Those are his delight. He delights in the righteous and the holy ones. He certainly doesn't delight in the wicked. In fact, he's angry with the wicked all day, all day the Bible says, and he's calling them continually to repentance. He wants them to get right. So the saints are going to be preserved because they're the ones who trust in the Lord and His goodness will be extended to them. See, we come to Psalms 31, verse 23. Oh, love the Lord, all ye saints. All the saints are to love the Lord and that's evidence because you hear and do His commands. If you love me, you keep my commandments. He that loves me is the one who has my commandments and keeps them. We love him, we keep his commands, we keep the sayings of Jesus, we show that we love him. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewards the proud doer. If you are loving the Lord and you are a holy one, you're going to be doing the word continually. And you're going to be faithful. Faithful are the ones you can count on, you know what they're going to do, and they're going to be consistent. And he also was going to reward the proud doer, the doer of the word, who is walking in the ways of the Lord. That's what you're to be, a consistent doer of the word, and you're to be faithful in everything. He will watch over you if he finds you faithful and reward those that are continual doers who are the saints, the holy ones. Psalms 34, verse 9. He'll also meet all your needs. O fear the Lord! Ye as saints, you've got to have the fear of the Lord. Remember, we perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. You've got to walk in the fear of the Lord at all times, which means you hate evil and you turn away from all iniquity and you, you put him first place and do everything he says. Fear the Lord, ye as saints, for there's no want or lack to them that fear him. No lack. That means God will supply your needs. The righteous have never been seen begging bread. We saw that scripture the other day. He'll meet your needs. There'll be no lack or want to them who are fearing Him. Psalms 37. You're going to trust in Him and know He's going to provide for you. Verse 28. 37, 28 says, For the Lord loveth judgment, His justice, His governing rules of justice, and forsaketh not His saints, Remember when it says he won't never leave you or forsake you, remember that it's a subjunctive mood. We've talked about that in the past. It means not automatic. It's he might never forsake you or might never leave you. Why? Because you meet the conditions. What's the condition? Being a holy one, a saint. The Lord loves judgment and forsakes not his saints. They are preserved, guarded forever. The holy ones God will guard. The seed of the wicked, though, they're going to be cut off. It's going to be all for them. All for, they're, going to be, they're finished. The ones who are walking in any kind of wickedness whatsoever. We see in Psalms 50, verse 5, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, or because of the sacrifice, talking about Jesus. So who are the ones that are going to be gathered together with him, the saints, and what, what about them? Well, 
they entered into the covenant because of what Jesus accomplished. And so that means we walk according to the covenant. We do what the Word says, so we perform our part of the covenant, so we see the promises come to pass, and that would include us being the holy ones. The saints will be gathered unto Him. We're gathering together, that's the rapture statement. Catching up to meet the Lord in the air. They're going to be gathered together because they walk in line with the Word of God. He's a faithful God for those who meet the conditions, see. Psalms 89, verse 5. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the who? The saints. Only the holy ones. He's faithful. He's faithful for those who will walk in holiness and follow his ways. Verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are ab about him. You have to have the fear of God at all times and know that God is faithful. You absolutely trust in Him. You know that He will perform His word. He will do exactly what He says. Psalms 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, that are keeping His commandments, doing His word, keeping the sayings of Jesus, hate evil. You've got to hate evil. You can't compromise it. You can't just put up with it. You can't just, uh, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm basically walking okay. No, you gotta, you're supposed to hate evil. If you hate evil, it'll never get a hold of you whatsoever. The things you hate, you will not have anything to do with. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He's going to know that where's the attack? Comes in the soulish realm, doesn't it? He will guard the souls of his saints if you hate evil, because you won't give place to it. Let it come into you and get a hold of you in your soul. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked, because the devils will be coming after you, and the evil people will be coming after you. He'll deliver, preserve and protect, guard the souls of the holy ones. And who are the holy ones? They love the Lord. The holy ones, they hate evil. The holy ones, they're the ones that are going to be delivered because they're going to do what the Word says and they're going to conquer any and all attacks that the enemy would try to bring against them. Also, if you're going to be one of the saints, which you are to be, Psalms 132, verse 9, Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. You are clothed because you are put on the garments of God by the Word of God and righteousness. And let thy saints shout for joy, because that's what it produces. Righteous will produce the holiness in you. And you'll be shouting for joy because of the work that God has done in your life. You're righteous and you're holy. That's why you see this tremendous work be accomplished. And what else will he do when this is on you? I will also clothe their priests with salvation. Oh, that means deliverance, victory, rescuing, safety, prosperity, victory in whatever situation. That's what this word's talking about. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Why? Because of all the victories. That being rescued, safe, preserved, delivered, prospered, victorious in every situation. Because she got clothed with righteousness and she's a holy one. She's seen this work be accomplished in her life. Psalms 149. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and let in His praise in the congregation of saints. Ah, that's again the holy ones. He wants you to be a praiser and a worshiper of Him. Sing a new song, and this is the word tehillah, which is a spontaneous praise in the congregation of the saints. Because you are a holy one, you've seen the work of God done in your life. And we come down to verse 4. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify or adorn the meek with salvation. And these are the ones who are the humble ones, showing you that the humble ones are the ones that are going to see this work be accomplished also. You have, must have humility as well as having the fear of the Lord. Let them praise his name in the dance, or that's the wrong way, verse 5 I want to go. Let the saints be joyful in glory, the who? The holy ones. The holy ones will be joyful. Why? 
because you have seen this work be done again. You see, he's seen his beautifying you with salvation. You're seeing be joyful in glory, the glory of God being manifest in you. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. The high praises of God will be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand because they're praising God, but they're also fighting at the same time. They got the word. You know, you keep one hand on the work and one hand on the weapon, remember. And the two-edged sword will be in your hand. You're going to smite anything because you've got to be victorious. You're going to have to conquer, as you will see, in order to come through to the end. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. We apparently have a part to play in seeing that come to pass as the saints who are going to be executing the rule and the reign of God and the judgments that are coming. To bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron, execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. We're involved in releasing the judgment against all of his enemies and executing the judgments that have been written. God is going to do a mighty work, but you gotta be, you gotta be righteous and a saint. You gotta know, you gotta be walking in the ways of the Lord for you to be in this position. Also, whatever your situation will be, God will be there to guard you. Proverbs 2.8, he keepeth the paths of judgment and preserves, guards the way of his saints. These are the faithful, godly, holy ones. And that's what you and I are to be. God will preserve your way if you're walking in the ways of the Lord. At the same time, we know that the evil things are going to be coming down the road. And the enemy is going to be trying to kill off those ones who are the saints. And there will be many who will be martyred. We know that but you also see who can come through in a little bit. Daniel 7, 18, The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. They're going to rule the holy ones, only the holy ones. And I would know the truth of this fourth beast. It's a verse from this one. And now it's talking about this evil beast, which is this end-time, ungodly world order that's going to be raised up. We come to verse 21. I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and was prevailing against them. These are ones that are going to get martyred. We see in verse 22, how long is this going to happen? Until the Ancient of Days came, which is when Jesus comes and catches up the church to meet the Lord in the air. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom after they have conquered and overcome, and they've now with the Lord and the marriage, and then they come back with Him, and they will be ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom with Him. The time will come. And who is it? It's always the saints. Only the holy ones will be there. Verse 25, speaking of the Antichrist, he'll speak great words against the Most High, and shall, word wear out means to harass constantly. The saints of the Most High. Remember, the tribulation is the greatest pressure that has ever come upon the earth. The harassing, that's why you've got to be firm. You've got to have the foundation laid. You've got to be strong and movable. The Word will do that. You can't do it yourself. God's Word in you will make you that way by hearing and doing the Word and His work be accomplished in you. And that means you've got to do everything to get righteous and holy, which means all the, all the unclean stuff has to be driven out, the purging, the cleansing. Everything's got to be gotten out. So only what's in you is the Word. Remember when the seventh month, when they came and they took the staves out, what all was in the ark? Only the Word. What's to be in you? Only the Word. Everything else is to be eliminated. You can't have any of this uncleanness stuff in you. So he, he's, he's going to be harassing the saints of the Most High, and he'll think to change times and laws, be given into his hand to a time and times and dividing a time. That's the three and a half years of his rule. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Yep, his day is about done. 
and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of his kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. We're going to be ruling and reigning. But you've got to learn your authority and learn to rule and reign and conquer all enemies in your life. You've got to do it now, and you're going to be doing it ongoingly. Hosea chapter 11, verse 12. Here it speaks, Ephraim compassed about me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. They're in trouble. They were in trouble, remember. But Judah yet ruleth with God, they were the king's line, and is faithful with the saints. Ah, the holy ones. You're going to be ruling. You're going to rule with God. And he's the one who's going to, he sees you are a faithful saint. You're going to be with him and ruling and reigning over the enemies. He'll be faithful with the saints to protect you, to guard you, and to bring you through. We also see in Zechariah chapter 14, when the day of the Lord is coming. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, terrible things. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. This is what's going to happen. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. He'll come. His feet will stand in the day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. There'll be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. There'll be a great earthquake, remember. It's going to be split. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azale, and the A, and you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and who's going to come with them? All the saints with thee. It's only the holy ones. You have to be a holy one. In fact, you've got to understand, the only ones that are with God are holy ones. The Old Testament saints, when they died, they went to hell. The ones who were evil went to the lower part and were in torment. The ones that were righteous and holy saints accounted because of what they, the way they walked were in the upper compartment, which was Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus, after accomplishing the redemption, and he went and preached the spirits in prison, they got born again. That was in the upper compartment of hell. And then what happened after they all got born again? They came up out of there. Who came up out of there? Was it all of them? Matthew 27, 15, 52, the graves were open and many bodies of the saints. Only the saints. The Old Testament saints who were counted righteous and accounted holy because of the things that they walked in his ways. Remember, those Old Testament saints, like they were walking, like uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were, were blameless walking in all the commandments that said of the law, even though they couldn't become righteous because they couldn't get a new spirit till Jesus came on the scene. But nonetheless, they did walk above reproach. So did Paul. Many bodies of saints which slept arose. So that's who came up out of there. Showing that who's the one that's going to come through? It's only the saints. In Romans chapter 1, we're speaking about the church. Romans 1, 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called, not called to be saints. Notice that to be. You can see it's italicized. Well, and we've talked to you about that. Anytime you see italicized, you know it's not in there. Stop and find out what it really says. Called and then saints. Well, here's the word called. It is an adjective and it is plural, so it's not a noun or a verb. It's like it would be really understand called ones. And then we see, then it talks about saints. Same thing, adjective and plural, but because they're both adjectives, it's not modifying, called's not modifying the saints. It's a separate one. Called ones, holy ones, is what it's essentially saying. Two different, it's saying what the, what the church is to be. What is the church? 
called ones. What else are they? Holy ones, if they're doing the word. That's the ones that see the grace to you and peace. Not everybody, all these ones that say grace to you, automatically everybody, <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. Grace has conditions. And here it shows, they, if you're not a holy one, is it coming to you? <laughs> nope. These people, unfortunately, take things out of context and miss it. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Same thing. The church of God, it was at Corinth, to Corinth to them that are sanctified. Wow, they've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Having been sanctified, accomplished work. See, these guys, were, there were people that were seeing the work be done. Not everybody, because they had a lot of problems in Corinth, but there were some, the ones that were, and he's speaking to them, called, again, these ones that are called, not to be called ones, Holy ones, adjectives and plural, both cases. Ah, that's who he's speaking to. With all those who are calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, these people are following the way of the Lord. These guys are righteous, holy ones that are responding to the call of God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. So otherwise, who's, who, even before the judgment came, who is the real church? The saints, the real church. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And is in all the churches of the what? The holy ones. Is everybody that's in a church necessarily a holy one? No, not unless they have seen the work be accomplished. From God's point of view, the church has always been the righteous and the holy ones. But there hasn't been a separation until the judgment comes on the church at the end of the age, and then there will be a separation because only the righteous will come through, and the rest of them will be abandoning or defecting or turning away in the apostasy, unfortunately. Because of the lawlessness and the unrighteousness. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, the holy ones, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful, well, that's the mark of the holy ones, remember? The saints, they're faithful in Christ Jesus. People never pay attention to what these address to. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. The saints he's writing to. Colossians 1.2, to the saints and faithful brethren that are in Colossae. It didn't say grace to all you that are there and then we'll, we'll address the saints. No, saints and faithful brethren, those are the ones that saw the grace and, and the peace because they had met the conditions. So all these letters are written to the called ones, the holy ones. <clears throat> and in Ephesians chapter 4, it speaks of the work that is to be happening from those who are in the fivefold ministry Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, or really sometimes this could even be thought of as one together, the pastors and teachers, because they're all the way it's split out here, but could be a fifth one. For the perfecting, complete furnishing of the saints. The who? The holy ones. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The saints are the holy ones who see this perfecting work be accomplished. And we see till we all might come, not automatic, it's supposed to happen, but why is it a subjunctive mood? Because it's not automatic unless people meet the conditions to see it happen. Till we all might come in the unity of the faith and of the precise correct knowledge of the Son of God, because we all got to get the knowledge, unto what? The perfect man. This is the perfected church, the saints. Unto the measure of the attained state, a metaphor, attained state fit for a thing. The measure of the attained state of what you're denied to be, righteous and holy, saints, perfected, the perfect man, of the fullness of Christ. That's a completed work being done, being filled, filled with the fruits of righteousness, filled with the things of God. We come to the fullness of Christ in our life. And then he's addressing further, though, he's talking about these guys that they weren't getting, they weren't dealing with themselves right. Be therefore followers or mametes, imitators of God as dear children. 
Walk in love, as Christ has loved us, and give himself for an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then he says, fornication, all uncleanness, any kind of uncleanness, covetousness, greedy desire for more, let it not be once named among you as becomes or as fit for the holy ones. Remember, he's addressing the holy ones. He says, you can't let this happen if you're going to be a holy one. You can't be in fornication, have uncleanness and covetousness. It shouldn't even be named once. Well, praise God, we can confess our sin and receive forgiveness. He'll cleanse us by the blood of Jesus. We repent and walk in it, and we, are for, we get forgiven, and we meet the conditions for, for being forgiven for anything you've done. Don't be under condemnation. Just realize that, you know, obviously, if we'd known the Word, we'd have never gotten involved in this stuff before, you know. We wouldn't have made the mistakes. God doesn't want anybody to have any uncleanness of any type in their life. It's to be eliminated. And when Jesus is coming back, we already saw the one where he comes with the saints. There's another one. 1 Thessalonians 3. In fact, let's back up a verse. The Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, because we're all commanded to walk in love to the end that he may establish, make stable, make firm, set fast, the words to Rizzo, your hearts unblameable in holiness. When you're in holiness, you're unblameable. Nobody can, you can't be censured for any reason. Before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all the other holy ones who are coming from heaven with them, the saints. It's all saints the holy ones, the righteous ones, and the saints. Remember, after the judgment's over, the church then is now the holy ones. That's the only ones that are left. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. He speaks here, when he took the book, the four beasts, the four Twenty elders before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, the holy ones. That's the ones who are now, have passed the test. This is in Revelation 5, when he's ready to take the book and open up the book and start unfolding the seals and start bringing the judgments and taking back the earth. At the same time, the enemy, as we saw from Daniel, but we'll see it here again, Revelation 13, 7, it was given unto him, this is talking about the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to conquer them. Who has given him that? The devil. The devil tells the Antichrist, go make war with the saints and conquer them. And authority was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, meaning he'll be in a position of authority ruling over all the world. And this is all going to happen is when after the seals, we get to the fifth seal where there's people martyred, he's going to be coming after all the saints trying to bring destruction against them. What's going to bring you through? He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. You don't go that route. Here is the patience, the steadfastness and the faith of the holy ones. They're going to be steadfast in soul, walking in line with the word at all times, and you're going to operate in faith of the holy ones because your faith will give you the victory and conquer all enemies. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Your faith will conquer the attacks of the enemy, as you will see, the holy ones. But also, Chapter 14, verse 12, tells us something about these ones, the saints. Here is the steadfastness of the saints. This shows whether you're steadfast or not. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. That would be the commandments of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, because that's what we're under, remember. And we are under the law of Christ. So we keep the law commandments. Anybody that tells you we're not under law anymore, they're wrong. We're not under the Old Testament law. The law has been changed. Now we're under the New Testament law, the law of Christ. And we keep all the commandments of Jesus Christ. It's a higher law for those after the Spirit. 
Here is the steadfastness of the holy ones. Here are they that are keeping continually, present tense, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. You're going to be keeping both. You're going to be keeping the commandments. And you're going to be keeping faith continually. You're going to be operating in faith at all times. I mean, you can't get into the flesh or the natural or back off or get into any unbelief or doubt or wavering. There's no reason to. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Suddenly. Well, that's when he's coming for the catching up of the church. Meet the Lord in the air. Who's going to be able to be with him? Blessed is he that has been watching. The guy is watching. Remember, we're supposed to watch and pray continually. Spiritually watching, alert, so the enemy doesn't get to us. Not watching for when he's going to come, in a sense, all along. We're to be watching because we're on guard against what the enemy will be up to. Remember, those guys who were only fit for the battle were the ones who didn't have any fear with Gideon and the ones who were watching because they brought the water up while they were watching, not stuck their head down in the water. And who, are keep, who keep his garments. That means you've got to keep the garments of God on you at all times. You can't have anything else. They're going to be keeping your garments, taking care of, keeping them. Observing, make sure it stays in the right, that state continually, ongoingly. Lest he walk, he might be walking unclothed. Naked or means unclothed, I mean you don't have the clothes on. You've got to have the garments of God on. You've got to have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You put on the armor of God, they have the power of God. You put your clothes with, the, with righteousness and all these things. And notice that he watching and keeping, he might be walking naked. By the way, when it talks about here about the walking, this is a subjunctive mood, meaning it could happen, but it shouldn't happen. But it could happen if you don't keep your garments. If you're not keeping your garments, you could be walking unclothed and you'd be in trouble ongoingly. And of course, if you are, the devils are going to get to you because you don't have any protection. You don't have any means. The door will be open for the enemy. And they, the bad guys now, not he, the evil ones, see his nakedness because he's not clothed. Not shame, but really the fact that he's not clothed. So, ah, we, if you're not clothed, you're not going to be protected. Remember, those ones who got protected and preserved and were guarded, the holy ones, the righteous ones, the ones who were clothed. That's why they're rejoicing, because God, God's going to accomplish all His great work. He's faithful to perform everything. Now, the ones who are going to get martyred, they are going to get martyred, as we see, different places. Revelation 16, 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets from from the house, given them blood to drink. They're worthy. They're going to get judgments coming against them because of all the evil that they've done. And these are the ones that are the martyrs. There'll be people that will be martyred. And we see another place where it talks about that in Revelation 18, 24. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, we know not everybody gets slain because there's people that are there alive to meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 15, 1. And this is, this is another, the things we see in Revelation, are, there's, they're showing you scenes or things that are at points in time. It's not continuous as far as a progression over time. There's different things that are spoken in different portions. This is part scene, and this is another sign scene, and this is another sign scene. Otherwise, it's not in an ongoing order like it goes 13, 14, 15, 16, progressively in time. It's not. The reason we say, because verse 14 talks about the rapture that comes, and here's also where the, the judgment comes. Here's the rapture. He comes in with his the sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's all the ones who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then there's the other one that comes, and now he's going to gather all those grapes that are ripe, and these are the ones that are going to be cast in the great wine press of the wrath of God. That's the judgment coming on the nations. That's at the end. 
And this tells you the tremendous, the blood came out of the wine press, space of 1,600 furlongs. Now, verse, chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven. This is now a different thing. Great and marvelous, seven angels have in the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. This is what's poured out at the very end. Could very well be the last ten days when we're in heaven, more than likely, because of what is said. I saw it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. If you got the victory over everything, conquered and carried off the victory, that, meant, that means he didn't get to you. Well, who would this be? These are the ones that are caught, were caught up to meet the Lord in the air that came through and they got to the rapture and they got the victory. You are going to be able to get the victory. You have to use your authority in conquering the enemy. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just, righteous, and true are thy ways. O thou King of saints, the Holy Ones. He's performed his rule for us, the King of the Holy Ones, the rule of the reign of God to deliver us. And we know because the judgments were brought, uh, brought, came forth. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art only holy, for all nations come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. They were made manifest. Meaning, looking back, you know, he conquered their enemies. He'll bring judgments against the ones that come against the saints, but he'll preserve and protect them, remember? He'll bring judgment against those ones. The wicked will be cut off. They're going to be, you know, you're going to be delivered out of the wicked's attacks coming against you. We've seen many scriptures about that in the past. So who are the ones who, con who come through? The ones who conquer and carry off the victory and are righteous and holy saints. Those are the ones that come through. Revelation 11. We pick up in verse 15. Here's the seventh angel sounding. And when that happens, that's the catching up of the church. That's the final trumpet, last trumpet, when they're caught up to meet the Lord near. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become of our Lord. That's been added there. It's talking about the same thing, but become of our Lord and of our Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Well, that means that we've we'll been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He's conquered all, he's also speaking to him, he's conquered all these enemies. Four and twenty elders sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God, who art and wast, wast and art to come, because you have taken your great power and has reigned. Conquered all these enemies, the kingdoms of the world. They've been conquered. Now, the nations were angry, see, and the wrath has come. Wrath did come. In the time of the dead, they should be judged, and they should be given reward to who? The servants, the prophets, the saints, the holy ones, well, they're the only ones that are with God. The rest of them are in the apostasy group, remember. And to them that are fearing, fear in thy name, small and great, should destroy them who are destroying the earth. That's what these evil people are going to be doing because there's going to be all kinds of wars that are going to be occurring. Remember, the days, it says if the days are not shortened, there wouldn't any flesh survive because that means there's going to be nuclear war, you better believe, at the very end. They talk about it now and they'll be talking about it. They've been talking about it forever, but you're going to see it's going to show up at the end because they're going to be destroying the earth. But the ones who are with the Lord are going to be protected, the saints who have gotten the victory over the beasts and all the things it spoke of. You have to have conquered and carried off the victory. That is mandatory, which means you have to have use your authority. You have to be walking right. You have to have the fear of God. You're going to be walking in righteousness. You're going to be walking in holiness. You're going to have the garments of God on. You're going to be watching. You're going to be doing, keeping the commandments of God. You're going to be steadfast. You're going to be operating in faith. You're going to be doing all these things. You're going to be the holy ones. Those are the ones that are going to come through. And, of course, 
as we saw before, but we'll look at it again for a moment. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. The marriage of the Lamb did come, remember, and his wife did make herself ready. We already saw these are past tense. It's already happened, but looking back on it, and what the statement is, to her was granted she'd be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And she did what was necessary, got clean and white as snow. Fine linens, the righteous acts, righteous deeds of the holy ones. These are the ones that have come through. So the ones that come through are the righteous, the holy ones, the clean, the white. And of course, we know they're also the disciples, as we know that from John chapter 2, that remember that the, in chapter 2, when it talks about the third day, there was a marriage in Cana, but then there was the marriage. The, the, the marriage is talking about the one that counts, the marriage of the Lamb. Who is who? Jesus is called. Oh, he's going to be there. He's the bridegroom. Well, who's going to be the bride? Only the disciples. And who are the disciples? The ones that bring forth much fruit. And they continue in his word. These are the ones who are the holy ones. That also shows you who is going to come through victorious. And we're going to be ruling and reigning. And who's the ones that come through the entire tribulation period and then go into the millennial reign and then are ruling and reigning with him through the millennial reign? It's the saints. Because at the very end, when the enemy is loosed, remember, after he's been bound for a thousand years and he goes out to deceive the nations, it talks about, He's loosed out of his prison. He goes out to deceive the nations. He goes to the bread of the earth and compass the camp of the saints. That's all that's around with God, only the saints. About in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And they are going to be absolutely destroyed. See, it's only the saints that are going to come through. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 even tells us, in verse 2, he says, Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? Well, he's looking for someone who can make the... They said, there's nobody here even is worthy to judge these things matters. Why? Because they didn't know the Word. You've got to know the Word if you're going to judge the world. You've got to learn the Word. You've got to become a scholar. You've got to become an expert in the Word of God. That's your mission for the rest of your life. And also, know you not that we shall judge angels. When that time might be, might be down the road in the whatever all will be happening in the eternal age, because there's no evidence we're judging the angels in the millennial reign. This might, must be prophetic about down the road. Who knows what life's going to be like down the road. But it says we're going to judge angels too. Much more things that pertain to this life, can't we? We got to be able to judge things, which means you got to know the word. You got to become an expert. You got to know exactly what the word says in all aspects so you walk in the ways of the Lord. So who comes through? The righteous, the holy ones, they have the fear of God. There will be people martyred. But the ones who carry off the victory over the beasts and the devil and all these things will make it to the end. All the saints, the holy ones, even if they got martyred, will be in the marriage. They'll also be in the millennial reign and they'll be rewarded, remember. So what's necessary? We've got to be righteous. We've got to be holy. Saints means we have to wash ourselves because we're given this time to wash ourselves clean and white and see God's total complete work to bring us to be the perfect man. See the fullness of Christ accomplished. See this work to bring you to the place, to the attained state that you're to be. The perfected, glorious end time church is going to have the glory of God poured out upon them. It's going to be a glorious time. You're going to be watching. You're going to be praying. You're going to be walking in faith. You're going to be using the keeping the commandments. You're going to be conquering every attack of the enemy. God is not leaving people when all the bad stuff comes on the scene. No. 
He'll be leading you. He'll, remember, it says he preserves the way of the saints, the holy ones. You meet the conditions, you will be protected. So this is why not only is it mandatory to become righteous, but it's mandatory to be holy ones, which means the cleansing, the purging process also has to be accomplished. Righteousness is doing the word of righteousness, what is right in his sight, to produce the fruits of righteousness. Holiness is produced in a measure by righteousness, but also by the cleansing. If you get cleansing of the filth, filthiness of the flesh and spirit to perfect holiness, it also involves the cleansing, remember, the purging that we saw thoroughly, having been sanctified, remember? So it's the total cleansing work, the total work in our life. Everything of the flesh has to be eliminated. And that would include is all the works, anything that's not of God needs to be eliminated out of your life. And we also cast out all the demons and drive them out. That's an ongoing work. Be continually casting out the demons and driving them out of every area and correcting all problems and walking in line with the Word so that you are righteous and holy before the Lord. And that is what your mission is right now, to get yourself ready for the things that will be coming. And you also are gonna be preaching the gospel and calling others to get on board as well, or they're in trouble, because they'll never come through the judgment of coming on the church if they're not righteous and holy, because only the saints and the righteous ones will come through. It's gonna be a glorious time. God does the work in you as you do the word. Don't put the brakes on him. Don't be resistant. Get into everything that he wants you to do. Get into the deliverance. Get into hearing and knowing the Word, learning the Word. Become a scholar in the Word. Study the Word. You've got to learn all these things. That's it. That's your life. You live unto Him. God will accomplish His tremendous work in all of us. Say this, Heavenly Father, we thank You and praise You for the Word of God that brings further revelation that we must be holy. We are commanded to become holy. We will become holy because we do the Word. And we understand doing righteousness produces holiness, but going through the cleansing process, thoroughly being cleansed, purging everything out of our life that's not of God, will produce the holiness. I will walk in all the ways of the Word of God. I will obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. I will walk by faith at all times. I will conquer all enemies. And when I, as I get the victory, I will come through to the end. And I will be in the marriage because I'm going to be clean and white because of the righteous deeds and actions that I've carried out doing the Word of God as one of the holy ones having been sanctified I thank you for this great work accomplished in my life as I am a hearer and a doer of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This is another important message with righteousness and holiness. That's the key. We're going we're gonna to talk about this holiness. As we continue on tonight, we'll be talking really about this covenant of holiness and all the things that we need to be do, doing. Praise God. Father, I thank you for all that you brought forth. Thank you for revelation and understanding of what is necessary, what God will do, and what we must be to come through all the things that are coming. Thank you, Father, for this great work you're doing in all of us, that we are hearers and doers of the word, and we are seeing not only the righteousness come forth, but also holiness as we see the total work of God accomplished in our life. Thank you for doing your work and bringing us to the place, spirit, soul, and body, being sanctified, holy, so we'll be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. Thank you for accomplishing this great work in all of us as we're hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.